Art is an adventure into an unknown world, which can be explored only by those willing to take the risks. We are living in the world of art. It's all about the colors. It's all about these diffusions. But what can describe art for us? How can we say that this is art and this is not art? And this is the biggest question. When we are looking at these colors, or what we call them block of colors, the interaction, the shadow, the light, how can we say that something is art and something is not? Who can define what is real and what is fake? Who can say that this is the actual art? Or someone can say this is actually not art. Who is in our society will determine that decision? Who will make the decision to say that these are the actual work of an artist and these are the actual work of an actually uh, uh, forger? Someone is actually making fake art rather than real art. And when we look at the biggest research in the world, we can see that the biggest research in the world said that actually 20% of the art that we have all over the world is actually fake art. When we go to a museum and we look at these art pieces that the experts say that it's actually art, that they said actually artists came and they use all their uh, 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 you know, tools and their colors and their styles to do all these colors, to actually go and do all this amazing painting. Is this real or this is fake? Who is determining that? So you can write in the chat, what do you think? Who is determining that these art pieces that we have in the museum, they are real or fake? Are they the experts? You are determining that or the artist is signing on the painting? So what do you think? How can we differentiate all this art? Because they say based on the recent study that 20% of the art pieces that we have in our museum, they are fake, but no one would like to admit that. So who do you think will determine that? Some, they are saying it's, it's the artist that, that actually they are signing on the painting. Okay, what else? The expert, yes. S certain examination, yes. That also can determine that. But what about actually the world of art? Is it what we see or is what it's reality? Let's see, maybe it's actually not what we see, it's actually something else that would determine what is art and what is not. People come from all over the world to see this. Yeah, he's good, yeah. It's a fake. Right, we talk about it. It's impossible. People believe what they want to believe. Because the guy who made this was so good that it's real to everybody. And who's the master? The painter or the forger? We are speaking about the art pieces and we are saying that actually someone is so good. He is making a, 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 a fraud by actually creating the same style and the same painting that the artist will do. So let's speak about one of the biggest cases that happened in the art world, which is related to Mark Rothko. So if you are not familiar with Mark Rothko, he got a certain way of painting, which is very unique. He said that he used block of colors. So in his painting, there are nothing other than colors, something like this. We have only block of colors. He's using red, black, orange, blue, and he will just have them on the canvas. And his uh, uh, art pieces, we, they call them master art pieces. They are selling for hundreds of millions of dollars for a painting with only block of colors. They say, you know, it's all about the space and the color that will give the atmosphere for the artist to show and express his emotion to the world. So now the question for you, when we are speaking about that, which one do you think is fake and which one do you think is real? We have number one and we have number two. Can anyone in the chat tell me which one do you think is fake and which one do you think is real? What do you think? Which one is fake? Let's see. Okay, let's make it easy. If you believe number one is fake, raise your hand. So in case you don't raise your hand, you believe is number two is fake. So if you believe number one is fake, just raise your hand. Okay, I can see so many people are raising their hand. All right. So, so many of uh, here, I think most of you, you said number one is actually fake. Someone said both of them are fake. <laughs> Maybe both of them are fake. But because for me, I am an artist and I understand exactly how art is done. Actually, when I went and I, I examined them, I discovered the following. 
I discovered that number one is real and the value for it is 168 million. And number two is fake, is worthless, zero. You say, wow. Now, how, how, how did we discover that? Because actually the story for this painting is very interesting. The story for this fake painting is very interesting because this fake painting was actually sold for millions of dollars. And the story is very simple. Look, what is the story? One guy in Europe, he said that he is dealing with a family in Europe that they are facing financial problems, but they are from royal family. And he had some undiscovered art. And this is what we call in the art world, mysteries. What's the meaning of mysteries? In the art world, we know there's something real and something fake. Experts will say, this is real, this is fake. But in the art world, there's something called undiscovered art. We call it mysteries. The meaning there is an art that the painter actually did, but he didn't uh, uh, do a, a gallery for it to sell it. He gave it as a private collection or actually someone bought it directly from the artist. And we didn't discover that. We don't have record on it. And suddenly we discover it. And usually it will be worth million of dollars. Sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars, because this is something no one knew about. And it's coming, and it's, it's the new one on the block. So one guy, he said, I have certain pieces of uh, art from uh, uh, Rathko, from uh, 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 different artists, and I would like to sell it to this gallery. Now, what do you think the gallery should do? If the gallery will go and see some art pieces, and they want to know if these are real or fake, what they will require? What do you think they will require to identify if this is fake or real? They say they will require the paperwork. They will say, give me the paperwork to see what's going on. And this is exactly what happened. They required the paperwork. And they looked at the paperwork and they say, wow, there are no paperwork. What? They asked them, where's the paperwork? They say, we check with the royal family. And they say, actually, they lost the paperwork. This is from a long time ago, so they don't have the paperwork. They say, OK, so what we need to do, we need to bring an expert in Mark Rothko to identify that. And even we can bring his son to see the painting to say, maybe this is real, maybe this is fake. So, so his son came and he said, wow, this is a nice painting. It looks like for my dad. And the experts, they came and they examined and they said, yes, it looks like actually from uh, Mark Rothko. But the reality is not because these experts who came Actually, we pay them money to say whatever we want them to say. And this is what will happen in the art world. The same way fraud is happening in re real world, where you are going to pay the auditors to say financial statement. They are amazing. The numbers are correct. You will go and be the experts in the art world because they will determine if something is real or fake. So we paid the experts. And we got some statements, but what about some experts, some original experts in Mark Rothko that they will not accept the bribes? Easy. We are living in the world of fraud. We created fake statements and we signed like they signed the statement saying this is original uh, painting. So now we have all the documents that we can submit to the gallery. We have all the documents that we can submit to a potential buyer to say, this is an amazing painting that's undiscovered. Would you like to buy it? And actually one of the collectors, he thought, wow, this is really amazing. And he bought it for millions of dollars. And after a couple of years, they discovered that this is actually fake. And he lost his money. How he, they discovered that? Because they were selling other pieces of art. And one of these pieces of art, they discovered is fake. So then they examined all these pieces of art and they discovered they are actually fake. But what is the reality? The reality that there was a Chinese painter. He is amazing in doing uh, forgery. And he was painting all these pieces for $1,000 a piece. And he was selling it to this guy who is in Europe to go and sell it as mysteries and discover art. And this guy was, uh, uh, was able to run to China. And he is actually behind all these fake pieces that uh, they were able to sell to the galleries for more than $80 million. And this is uh, going to bring us to a very important question. For me, if I am going to examine anything in life, it can be a painting, financial statement, a product that I'm going to buy, a statement that you are going to say, how can I verify if it's real or fake? I don't want someone to actually give me the fake statement, give me the fake information, give me the fake report. How can I verify that what I am getting, it can be information, product, or a statement that is actually real or fake? 
And this is our discussion today. Today, we are speaking about the concept of fraudology. What's the meaning of fraudology? It's the art of fraud. We call these individuals who are doing fraud, they are artists. They know how to manipulate the psychology of the individuals they are dealing with and manipulate the controls, figure out how to trick our controls. And this is what we call it, it's about the art. What are the methods and the technique and the game plans they use to be able to trick us as a human and to trick our controls. But at the same time, we are speaking today about the science of uh, uh, fraud examination. What is the science we need to use as a fraud examiners, as a professionals in the market to be able to uncover their tricks? Remember, they are going to use art. They are going to use techniques. They are going to use tricks. For us, we are not allowed to use the same tricks. For us, we are not allowed to manipulate them. We need to use science. We need to use analytical tools. We need to use something like SAS where you will go and buy a software inside your organization to help you analyze your documents, your record, to help you find the logical connection, to visualize your data, to be able to find exactly what you are looking for. You are not going to try to use your human tools where you are going to use Excel or you are going to analyze the statement by looking at it like what we used to do before. Do you have science? Do you have data analytics tools for you to help you in your analysis? Or you are still using the old ways? They say the main difference between today in the art world and the old days, today we have X-ray. Today we are using science and technology to be able to uncover fraud from real. In the same way, you are using today software like SAS to be able to identify the information to see exactly how can we look at the data and analyze them to know if this is a fraud or not. If this is false positive, which is something will show it's a fraud, but in reality is not, or this is an actual red flag for fraud. So what do we call these individuals who are doing fraud? We call them, the definition for them, we call them con artists. What's the meaning of con artist? They say it's a person who cheats or trick others for them to be able to believe that something that's not true is actually true. So they, someone is going to deceive you. Do you know where is this word coming from? Con artist. It's coming from the word confidence artist. The meaning first, they need to gain your confidence. I need to come, I need to look the part, I'm looking like I'm an artist or I'm a collector or I'm actually in the art world and I'm gonna sell you actually the painting that I have. I'm gonna come as an executive, as a manager, as CEO, and I'm gonna go and make you invest in my organization. Or I'm gonna come as a trader and I'm gonna make you buy my products. These guys, they are artists, but they are confidence artists. They are gonna gain your trust. Once you trust them and once you believe what they are saying, after that, they are going to violate your trust and do the fraud. And this is exactly how they do their skills. They are masters, not only in fraud, but they are masters in deception. They know exactly how to deceive you in the world they say, in the psychology they play, and in the art they are uh, going to do. So let's speak about a very interesting artist. They call him is number one, is the greatest forger in the world. Elmore uh, Dihori. Elmore Dihori, he was amazing in his ability to do fake painting. No, I don't want to say fake painting. We'll come to that later. We call it forgery. What's the meaning of forgery? He is making a painting looking exactly similar style like all these artists, like Picasso, like Modigliani, all these amazing artists that they did unbelievable pieces. He understood their style. He understood how they are doing the actual painting. And he decided to do exactly the same style that they are using with different concepts, different ideas. And he was even able to imitate artists who are still alive. So in that way, you know, even the artists, when they will look at the painting, they'll say, when did I paint this? I don't remember. And he was able to produce more than 1,000 fake pieces. So many of them, they were actually sold to museums, and the museums, they thought they are by the actual artist. He was so smart and clever in doing his scheme. And he was able to trick the galleries. He was able to trick even the experts. He even challenged the experts. He said, I will give you one of my paintings, and you bring an original Picasso, and you can convert them. And I challenge you that you will never figure out which one is real, which one is fake. He was that confident. He was able to actually do massive amount of fraud until 
he decided to do 40 pieces and sell them to a millionaire uh, 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 living in Texas. And the millionaire went and he brought an expert and they examined them and they thought there's something not right because they don't have uh, uh, all the proper work in order. He said, wait, what's the meaning all the proper work in order? He was so smart. He was able to not only create the fake art pieces, he created the fake paperwork. He will go create all the fake stamps. Remember, he's an artist. Artists, they can fake everything. He created the fake stamps. He created the, the fake documents, and he actually appeared that these are genuine art pieces. He was able to manipulate all the process. But when he sold these 40 pieces to this person, and the person decided to verify these documents, he discovered they are fake. So in that way, he decided to take case against him. And after that, he was able to run to Spain and stay in Spain until the French government told him, you need to come to us. We are going to take action against you. Once then they agreed to expedite him to France, and he was in France, and he's going to get his punishment for all these art uh, pieces that he did as a forgery, that he destroyed our art world. He decided to take a pill of a poison and kill himself. On the way to the hospital, they couldn't save him, so he died. But everyone believed that maybe he forged his own death. Remember, he's an artist. Some individuals, they believe he was alive. He was able to run away because he got so much money, and he was able to forge even his own death. But we don't know. And this is reality what will happen. They made about it a very interesting movie called Real and Fake. This is number one forgery artist in the world who fake all these art pieces. So what we can see when we are speaking about the world of fraud, we can see that, like what Picasso said. Pablo Picasso said that good artists uh, copy, great artists steal. Someone can, will say, no, 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 I don't understand what's the meaning of that. Because so he said there are two kinds of artists. One kind of artist they copy. So for example, uh, because so he did a painting and it's in one museum, someone will go and copy exactly the same building and sell it in the market. But in that way, you know it's fake because actually it's already in the museum. So how come you are buying it? But these are the good artists. They can see an art piece and they can copy it as it is and they can produce it thousands of times and they can sell it in the market. But all of us, we know, even if you hang it in your room, that this is actually not real because the actual art piece is in the museum. But they say great artists, they see, they mean they are gonna go and take the style of the artist. They are gonna take the concept, the, the uh, uh, approach of the artist, and they are gonna use their own style to be able to create a new invention, a new art piece, a masterpiece, that everyone will think that this is done by the actual artist. So this is why when we are studying the world of fraud, the world of fake and forgery, we need to understand some important terms. And these terms are very important when we are dealing with any fraud case. The first one is forgery. The meaning a genuine document that has been unlawfully altered or produced. And this is very important for you to understand it when you are dealing with a fraud case. So let me explain. Let's speak about money, because now, uh, Better than making fake art pieces, we can make fake money. So let's speak about money. When we are speaking about money, what can happen with money? With money, we can create actually money. It can be real or fake. So if we call this money is a forgery, the meaning we have used the tools that the central bank used, and we have used the paper that the central bank used, and we have used the, that, uh, the plates that the central bank used, and we printed a, a, a copies of this money without the authority of the central bank. So this is what we call it forgery, which is an actual genuine document, but created without authority from the central bank. Someone printed money using the central bank machines or using the papers of the central bank without authority from the genuine central bank. But it's a genuine document. If someone will go examine it, it's 100% matching the actual dollar. No one is going to know it's fake because it's not fake. It's a genuine. It's an actual one. But it's without the authority of the central bank. So in the world of art, if someone will go and take the style of the artist, and he will go and do an actual painting following the same design, using the same material, using the same ink, and following the same approach of the artist. But this is a new masterpiece. This is, we call it, it's amazing, it's forgery, forgery, the meaning the only thing that he missed, he didn't do it by the artist. The artist didn't give him the authority to do it and sign his name on the painting. 
But as a painting is genuine, but it actually is not by the artist, it's forgery, it's not done by the artist. So to give you an example for it in the art world, for these ladies who would like to go on Instagram and buy these Chanel bags, these said, you know, amazing uh, Cartier, but they are actually not real. They are from China. But why they are so happy with the product they are buying? Because it's forgery. The meaning someone in China was using the same style, the same material, everything the same, exactly 100% copy of the original uh, product, but actually they are maybe changing the design for it, or they're changing the color, or they are making the same color. But it's actually the same photocopy. So in that way, when you go by it, even when you go to the airport, the airport security will not be able to identify that this is fake. They will think this is real, this is original. And even they produce with it an actual original receipt like you are buying it from Cartier. So, and the selling at what? At 20% of the original price. So we call this forgery. It's genuine, it looks like everything is the same, but actually is not done by them. Or when you buy an iPhone produced in China, it's exactly the same material of the iPhone and everything inside is the same, but is not produced by Apple. So this is what we call forgery. Now let's go to the next one, counterfeit. They say it's a copy of genuine documents. So here is with a counterfeit, someone decided to create fake currency, but actually, it was not matching in the meaning there is no security feature in it it's a, it's a genuine document but is it's counterfeit the meaning it's actually a, a, a copy but is missing some features maybe the ink is not correct maybe the painting is not correct maybe the security features is not accurate but it's a counterfeit so it's a photocopy of the original but is not real this is why if you go buy any of these products that are counterfeit in the market for example, you want to buy a camera, a web cam for your computer, and you see something saying it's a Logitech, but you know it's not really Logitech, or you want to buy Nike shirt, but you know it's not Nike shirt. So you are buying a Nike shirt, then you discover that the color will disappear, or you discover that it's going to shrink. The meaning it's a, it's a copy of the genuine document, but it's not an actual genuine document. They are not using the actual material. They are missing some of the concepts in the design. So this we call it counterfeit. Now, when we are speaking about fake, we say it's an, uh, an identi uh, identity document that isn't officially produced or recognized. The meaning with fake, someone creating completely fake product. The meaning, the design is not actually matching, the, the uh, uh, color is not matching. A very simple example, like when you go buy a board game. When you buy a board, board game, they say, here are dollars. You see the size is not matching. You know it's fake. You know the paper is not matching. You know it's fake. Or now you can go to the market and go uh, buy fake Picasso. They say, this is fake Picasso. Would you like a Picasso painting? It's for $10. You can take it, put it in your home. It, you know it's fake. The color is not correct. The size is not correct. The actual painting is not 100% correct. And the material used is actually not the original one. So this is where we need to differentiate when we are dealing in the art world between them. Now, how can we see this fraud that's happening? How can individuals manipulate? Not only in the art world, they can produce fake documents, but also in what we call any kind of documents that is produced like what happened here. This is a very interesting story about this lady that was able to go and manipulate all the letters created by the writers. So her story is very interesting. She's an artist. No, she's a writer. But she wrote so many books and articles, and no one is interested in her style. The same like so many of the artists, no one is interested in their style. But she discovered one of the letters in one of the books she was reading, written by a very famous art, uh, writer. And she uh, gave it to a gallery, and the gallery actually bought it from her for a, a good amount of money. Then she thought, maybe rather than me writing my own articles, I can use the style, I can use the language of the famous artists, no, sorry, not artists, famous writers in the world, and I can actually write it on old paper and say that these are actually some of the notes or letters or writing that I discovered related to these arts, uh, writers. Now, the issue here, here we don't need an expert. The amount is $50, $100, $100. So as long as the expert will look at it and they say it looks like genuine it's written in the same way that uh, the writers will do as long as it looks like appropriate they are gonna buy it from her 
and she started doing this day after day until she wrote more than 400 letters. 400 letters that they are actually not original. It's written by her own concepts and ideas following the styles and the approach of the writer. And uh, then the FBI discovered that she was doing this because she was speaking with one of her friends and her friends decided to do the same approach, but he's not that good. He, he, he was doing fake letters, the meaning or uh, immediately someone discovered that these letters are not uh, uh, by the original approach and then they were able to uh, arrest her. How can we identify that something is real and something is fake? Usually when we are dealing in the art world, everyone in the art world is so excited. They are just trying to sell you anything. They just want to make the money. And because sometimes they are so excited, they destroy exactly what they are trying to sell. It's exactly like what ha happened here. So sometimes when they are trying to, to sell you something, they are, they are so excited. They just want to sell it to you. They just want to make money, right? And what they do in that way, in that way they are actually destroying the art world. Nimessä miljoona siellä herra. Tuleeko muita tarjouksia? Ei tule. Miljoona ensimmäinen, miljoona toinen, miljoona kolmas. And this is exactly what will happen. So how can we identify in actual world when we are dealing in investigation to understand if this is real or fake, if this is a fraud or not fraud? They say art is gonna actually disturb, is gonna misrepresent what's happening. But science, our fraud investigation techniques using a system will help us in figuring out exactly if this is a fraud and this is not. This is why we are living in the digital age. It's not anymore we are gonna examine the letter to see if it's real or not. We are gonna use our magnifying glasses and see exactly if this is genuine or not genuine. Today we have science. Today, even diamonds, diamonds, they have electronic device that you attach to the diamonds and the electronic device will say, this is an original diamond and this is not. It's not anymore the expert who is going to go examine the diamond to say if this is true or false. And this is where we need to use that science. So let's go over a case study. We are going to do a case study together to figure out how can we identify if something is fraud or not. So let's speak about a very famous artist in England. His name is uh, uh, Larry. Lawrence Larry, he was a very famous artist in England, and his style is very simple. He will use what we call stick, a match stick man. Can you see the painting? His, all his painting is about doing industrial painting, and he is using these stick mans. Can you see? They are only a head and a stick body, two hands, two legs, and some dogs around. So we call them, they are uh, match stick mans. And this is where, because of his style, because his kind of painting is so simple, so many forgery and so many uh, fake painting were created saying that this is the actual painting by Lawrence Larry. Because his style is so simple, everyone can imitate. So let's go over a case study. The case study that one of the clients contacted us and said that we have mystery, we have undiscovered world, world uh, a masterpiece by uh, 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 Lawrence Larry. And we have three masterpieces that we don't know if they are genuine or not. So we have the first one, the two old uh, couple. We have the lady with two dogs and we have crown scene. Now you, as a fraud examiner, you need to tell me what are the tools, what are the techniques, what are the documents that you are going to try to get to be able to verify if this is fake or real. So here, let's do it with the chat. So I'm going to move here the chat and I'm going to get your comments. What do you think we need to do? What do you think we are going to do to verify if these are real or fake? You can write that in the chat. Okay, someone said we need to look at the purchase receipt. Great. So we ask the person, do you have purchase receipt? He said, no, unfortunately, I searched. These pieces are not for me. My dad bought them when he was actually collecting art. And when I searched the house, I couldn't find any purchase receipt. Nothing. Zero. Someone say, can we find the signature on them? Yes, we check on all of them, and on all of them, we have the signature. Good idea. The signature is there, but we don't know if they are real or not. Someone say, can we inspect the painting? Yes, we inspected the painting. We brought an expert in art, and he confirmed 100% this is an actual painting done by Lawrence Larry. The expert said, but uh, do we trust the experts? 
someone said we need to look at the paperwork correct we went and we tried to find any paperwork related to the painting the meaning if they are actually selling this painting it should be sold in a gallery you are not going to buy directly from the arts so we went we examined the gallery and we couldn't find any paperwork related to this painting so so until now we don't know now the the, the critical issue is like this if we can prove that these are original painting we can sell them for around 200,000 pounds but if they are fake they will be sold for 20 pounds so how can we discover that this is the uh, uh, original or not experts is not enough today when you are analyzing your data going and bringing experts in a fraud is not enough we need to use tools we need to use system data analytics software to help us analyze the data and give us conclusion if there is a red flag of fraud so someone said we look at the ink okay good idea we look at the ink so we decided to take all these painting and send them to an ink expert and this is what they do in the artist world in, in, in the actual world they go send it to an ink expert to take small pieces of ink from the painting and use a scientific lab to identify what are the color use what are the types of the color what is the age of the color so all that can help us in figuring out exactly what happened so that's a good approach someone said we can use x-ray yes we can use x-ray x-ray is very good in going and doing an x-ray why to see exactly is this actually a painting on top of a painting is this actually the right material what do we have behind the painting what is the material that are used is it actually the same style of the artist some artists they have a style of using for example a pencil to do the drawing and then after they finish the painting they will use the brush to actually do it and then they use final brush to find to do the final touch of their painting so we need to see is it following the same style so in that way we went and we sent it to x-ray now the x-ray confirmed that these are most likely original paint the x-ray but we still need to find some kind of paper trail remember in the audit we can say we have um, 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 a purchase uh, happen here we need to find an audit trail we can say someone is doing corruption we need to find a payment always we need to find evidence you can't say this is a fraud or not without evidence so what we decided to do we decided to go and look at these paintings and when we look at these paintings one of the paintings got something very interesting when we flip the painting on the back of the painting there was a mark x9101 and it looks like actually this was in a gallery so this it looks like a number of a painting that was in a gallery so we said wow that's great the meaning that this painting was sold in that gallery so immediately we said we need to go to that gallery to look at their archive to see exactly do they have a record a document showing that painting in the record that's a very nice approach always in audit in fraud examination you need to follow the clues you need to find something find wire transfer find the payment find something unusual and you need to track it to figure out exactly what happened so we went to that gallery and we decided to look at the archive and thank god they have the archive not only by the numbers and the name they have it with a photo and this is what we have found amazing we found actually that th this is the original painting and this is the photocopy that the gallery had they are matching so this is the actual painting that the gallery sold and this is by Lawrence Clark. yes amazing news now this is very good news for the first one but what about the second one what about the third one what can we do this one we know that this is the uh, uh, original one and and, and uh, this is the photocopy that the gallery they have or record to show they are matching approximately 100 percent so now we have a record and we can obtain a copy and we can submit it to the collector saying this is an actual painting by the artist and how can we prove this is an actual painting by the artist is not a, a, a fake or it's a forgery because the gut on the back the actual sticker from that gallery with the number and we verified the age and verified all the other elements. So that give us assurance, not 100%, we can say 90% that this is an actual masterpiece. But what about the rest? How can we verify these other two? Now we went and we looked at the style of the artist. Always we look at the style of the artist. Remember we sent some ink samples. And when we sent some ink samples to the lab, we went and we studied that artist. We studied uh, Lawrence Larry. And Lawrence Larry, he said something very interesting. He said, I'm a very simple man. I use certain kind of color. 
I, I, I use uh, 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 Aubrey Black, uh, 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 Vermilion, uh, Version Blue, uh, yellow, uh, 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 yellow color, flat white. So these are the colors that the artist is using. And he said, look what he said, and no medium that I ever used in my painting other than these five colors. Wow. So the artist said that all his painting that he did, that he never used any kind of ink or any kind of uh, you know, colors other than these colors. So that's amazing. That's great. So what we decided to do, we went to the lab and we asked them, can you tell us what happened with this painting? They said, when we examined the, and actually this painting, the crowd, we discovered that he used these five colors. But when we examined these uh, two couples, we discovered that he used zinc white. We wait, wait. He used zinc white? Not, as he said, he is using actually flake white. They said, no, no, no. For that photo, for the couple, he used actually zinc white. So we say, unfortunate, this is fake. But because we study for examination, we didn't study, you know, any other approach. We said, maybe we need to verify. Maybe the artist is lying and the painting is true. Never ever, when you are doing fraud examination, to trust the word of a witness against the word of the suspect. Why? Sometimes witnesses, they lie. Sometimes witnesses, they have motive. And if you follow the statement of the witness to believe it's 100% true and you don't verify it, maybe you are going to accuse a witness of something and then you discover later that you are mistaken. So what we decided to do, we said, maybe we need to search the artist more. So we went and we looked at some documentary movies, and we went and we looked at some photos in his, uh, you know, uh, studio, and we were very surprised. We noticed that when we are lo looking at the documentary movie, that he got a very hidden zinc white color under his disc. Not only that, that couple photo that he, uh, he uh, we have it here is actually was features inside the documentary movie saying that this is one of the pieces that he did and he was doing it in experimental stage. So in that way, he cheated us. He was using other than fake white, but he did it experimental and he decided not to tell anyone because he doesn't want to say that he's not a simple man. So we went and we looked at all this uh, evidence and we say based on all these events and based on the analysis of the photo and because we have it, we see it directly in the documentary movie as the same exact painting in his studio next to the zinc white that he said he's not using, we can say that this is an actual original piece. So we're like, wow, great. So now we verify that this is the original piece. What about the third one? The crowd one, we say based on the crowd one, we couldn't find any other evidence to verify exactly what will happen, but it's okay. What we are gonna do, we are gonna go and examine uh, uh, all the evidence that we have and submit it to expert. At the stage, we gathered all our scientific evidence and we brought three experts who specialize in his art and we told them based on all these scientific evidence and based on our examination, you need to make determination. This is why even if you buy SAS, software, even if you buy all this data analytics, is not enough. You, as a fraud examiner, you need to know exactly how to make judgment decision. The system saying it's a red flag. The system is giving you an, a, a, a signal, indicator. Is this an actually fraud or is it false positive? It's not fraud. So they say these experts, they examine the three painting and they confirm that they are original. And based on that, the client was able to sell them for more than 200,000 pounds. And this is always the idea that sometimes we need to verify, sometimes we need to check. Don't believe any statement you hear from someone because anything needs to be verified. So this is a very interesting story to see what will happen. Now let's speak about you know, the, art, uh, the, the uh, world of art and how fraud will happen in the world of art. Because they say the easiest thing, if we can make a photocopy, if we can make a forgery, what about stealing the actual art piece, right? Fraudsters, they have another approach. They say, if I can't make fake documents, I will actually steal the original document and I can do whatever I want. I can sell it, I can manipulate it. And this is exactly what happened to the Mona Lisa. Do you remember what happened in the Mona Lisa? In 1911, uh, uh, one guy decided to go and steal the Mona Lisa. And what he did, he did something very interesting. 
at that time, the Louvre, they decided to actually have glasses on top of all the painting from one side to protect them, from the other side to ensure no one will steal them because it's easy for you to steal a painting. You can bring a knife and you can just cut the painting and take it. But if you have a glass on top, it's harder. So they decided to bring this guy, an Italian guy, to actually go and install the glasses on the painting. So he noticed that you know, they are implementing these techniques to install the glasses. So he decided to hide inside the louver uh, in the closet. And once they closed, he was, oh, and three other individuals were, were, uh, uh, were in the louver. They were able to steal that painting. The story say he, he did it alone or with help of uh, another two, we don't know. But actually they say he mainly, he was able to actually go and break the glass from the Mona Lisa. He was able to cut the painting take it with him and he was able to leave the Louvre Museum. And for around one day, for more than 24 hours, no one discovered that this piece is missing. Until one of the visitors, he said, looks like something is missing, there's no painting there. Then they discovered that Mona Lisa is missing. And then it was a public news. Before this incident, no one in the world knew what is the Mona Lisa. It was a normal painting <laughs> that is, was actually there in the museum. Someone will look at it and they say, it's okay. It's a nice, beautiful lady. But when the, once all, everyone in the world, they say, oh my God, there is one important piece, the artist, they stole it. Sorry, not the artist, the, the uh, 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 criminal, he, he stole it. So in that way, this is definitely the most important piece in the museum, in the Louvre. So the global news said this is the most important art piece in the world. And it was massive publicity on this artist. What he did with it, he actually took it and hide it in his uh, uh, home for a, a couple of weeks. And after that, they were able, uh, they, they couldn't find it. Then he decided to go to Italy and sell it. And when he was trying to sell it, imagine someone will come to an, an art dealer. He said, listen, I have the actual Mona Lisa and I would like to sell it. They said, really? <laughs> he called the police and they actually arrested him. And this is what happened here in, in, in this case. But do you think this is the actual story? Remember, in our life, or every time we hear about fraud case, there is the told story, there is the media story, and there is the other reality. What happened in reality? Is this the actual story, or story of what happened to the Mona Lisa? Or like what they say in the art of steel, it was the biggest fraud in the art history ever. Done not by this guy. This guy, he's in prison. But it's, uh, by the way, he's in prison only for nine months but it's done by a master artist, by a master criminal who was able to make millions by actually doing this without selling the Mona Lisa. The theft of the Mona Lisa. The story begins in Paris, 1911, not with Chaudron, but with an Italian, a poor carpenter named Perugia, who a few months before the theft works a contract at the Louvre. As with any menial job, he learns many menial things, such as where the entrances and exits are, the guards' names, rotations, and the like. Little did he know that this otherwise useless information would prove to be quite important, for it is when Perugia's contract ends that his destiny begins. Fate taps Perugia on the shoulder. Eduardo de Valfierno, a criminal mastermind. Valfierno asks Perugia to steal the Mona Lisa for $30,000. It's like a million back then, an offer a poor carpenter could never refuse. The adventure of the theft is a story in and of itself. In short, through luck, cunning, lazy security, and the horrible disadvantage of being Italian, he actually succeeds. The carpenter steals the Mona Lisa, and the theft makes world news. As promised, he produces the Mona Lisa. Valfierno produces the money. But he makes a strange request. He asks him to hold on to her just a little longer so he can arrange for a transit overseas. Perugia agrees and waits. And waits. And waits. Historians here. And it is now that I tell you of Yves Chaudron. Six months before the theft, Valfierno commissions Yves Chaudron 
the world's greatest forger, to reproduce the Mona Lisa six times and perfect. An Herculean task only Chaudron could accomplish. Valfierno then sails to America and finds six of the greediest art collectors and poses this question to them. Should the Mona Lisa suddenly become available, would you pay $300,000 for it? He asks all six, and all six say yes. And that is when Valfierno pays Perugia to steal the Mona Lisa. He then ships Chaudron's perfect fakes and collects $1.8 million. A fortune beyond comprehension. You see, all he needed was the news of the theft. Not the Mona Lisa. To him, she, herself, is worthless. And that is the story of the theft of the Mona Lisa. Fraudsters, they can actually do fraud without stealing from you. They just create the illusion. And this is the main concept. Someone can hack you. No, no, they don't need to hack you. They just call you and they say, listen, we have hacked your organization. Be careful. You look at your data center, you can access it. So you think someone hacked your data center. But actually, no. They deactivated something in your data center. Now, you, don't, you, you think they hacked your data center, they request money from you. So be careful. You need to always look and examine and see, is this actually reality what happened or what we are dealing with? But today, we are speaking about something more dangerous than money, more dangerous than products, more dangerous than actually uh, 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 all the financial information that we have. We are speaking about the knowledge. We are living in the digital world. And they say, be aware of false knowledge. It's more dangerous than, than ignorance. If individuals will go over the internet and you speak about your goods and products, if your competitors will go over the internet and they will write bad review about your organization, if the vendors, they are going to go and hear what they are saying in the news about you, and they are not going to give you goods and services anymore because they are afraid you are not going to pay. The current world we are living in is driven by what we call it the fake news. We have fake news around us every day. Someone will say, Corona is real. Corona is not. Corona is going to come. Corona is going to go. Organizations are going to corrupt. The economy is going to collapse. We are going to close. We are going to open. And because of this massive amount of fake news that currently is being produced, we are living in a state of fear. We don't know what's happening. And even if someone said something about you, for example, your product is bad or your, your product can heal Corona if you are selling any kind of medical products or the opposite, your uh, actually uh, products and solution are going to cause Corona, like what they say for so many of things like cigarettes and other things, which is maybe real, maybe not, consumers are going to take action. Until you go to the market and correct this information, disaster can happen. But the main question that we always need to ask, why? A newspaper, why actually media outlet they create news in this way? They create fake news. I'm going to show you a very interesting clip from a movie called Shipping News. And in this clip, you can see that the, the role of the media is to create panic. The role of the media is to find anything all over to say, Corona is bad, Corona is going to come, Corona is going to go. They just want to have news. And if there is no news, they are going to create the news. This is what they do in the media world. And we are victim of it because they are going to say anything just to create news. So let's see exactly how they are creating this fake news. So here in the clip, one guy is going with the head of a newspaper and he is trying to learn how he should generate the news because there is no news actually happening in a small town uh, uh, next to the ocean. So let's watch. Your spelling is fine and I've seen plenty worse grammar, but, but finding the center of your story, the beating heart of it, that's what makes a reporter. Now, you have to start by making up some headlines. You know? Short, punchy, dramatic headlines. Now, have a look. What do you see? Tell me the headline. Horizon fills with dark clouds. Imminent storm threatens village. But what if no storm comes? The village spared from deadly storm. how they create the news. They just want to say anything. They say, Corona is going to affect us. If it didn't affect us, they say, Corona didn't affect us. Good news. <laughs> and this is what will happen. This is why when we are examining the documents and record, you need to check everything. Don't trust anyone or any statement from the media, from a witness, from a suspect, 
always you need to go and verify this information. And the issue today within the digital world we are living in, we have also social media creating more hype. Someone is saying something and someone is liking it and uh, we have so many fake followers and so many likes and comments and our algorithm that's creating our world and making us really distracted. So how can we filter between all these data? And this is the biggest question. How can we be able to find what we are looking for, filtering between the information to be able to figure out what we are looking at? Is it fact or is it fake? What's going to help us in the world? Today in the world we are operating in, in, because of the massive number of information and the facts that we have, the only way for us to do it is by using science, by using technology, using systems like the systems that uh, currently we have in our hands, Excel or Word documents is not going to help us. We need a system like the system that they have in SAS to be able to help you filter the information, find exactly what you are looking for. So let's end with uh, this uh, interesting video to explain to you how can you use analytics to be able not only to help you in finding the fraud you are looking for, to help your managers, your employees in making the right decisions. Because making the right decisions, figuring out exactly what is true and what is not, is based on information that's filtered through the system. Decisions move the world, and the better they are, the better we become. It sounds simple, but of course, it can be extremely complex. And so this is where we come in. SAS analytics help you use information to its greatest effect. And for us, there's nothing more important. We create for one simple reason so you can turn today's most critical challenges into tomorrow's great decisions and move the world. Like us, you understand every decision is better with knowledge. At SAS, we drive ourselves every day across the globe, not so much to solve the unanswered question or achieve the unmet need or unveil the next big thing, but to give confidence to those who can. SAS, the power to know. And this is exactly the main concept, the power to know. You need to have a system to identify if what you are looking for is real or false. You need to know what you are looking at. Is it real or fake? And if you don't have the proper system, you are going to end up with so many false positives, so many red flags saying it's a fraud, and you are going to waste your resources on it, and then you discover it's no fraud, or you will not find the fraud that you are looking for. I hope that this session was able to add to you different kind of view about how we can use science to go after fraudsters and uncover their plan. Thank you so much for attending, and I hope I see you in next episode.